This is the Kestrel Country Podcast, where we discuss the people, places, and events all around Kestrel Country. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Kestrel Country Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Church, joined here once again by my lovely wife and co-host, Catherine. Hello, hello. And we're coming to you from a beautiful, sunny February day. It's good to be here. <laughs> it's- Got through Valentine's Day. <laughs> we made through it. It was a rough had a, Valentine's. Had a little bit of a stomach bug through our house. I know it's been going around. Yep. Um, but we're all back on our feet doing well grateful for that yeah absolutely so um yeah we missed last week um but good to be back podcasting this week with ed driscoll yeah and you were the only one interviewing him so i'm excited to hear it yeah a lot of you may or may not know behind the scenes of a lot of our marketing is ava driscoll so ed is ava's dad longtime friends and um, Ed has a deep back background, long time background in uh, agriculture. Yeah. So I wanted to hear from him about kind of the area, um, agriculture, how it's changed here, what he does specifically with seed treatment, um, with different uh, cereals, pulses, all kinds of fun things that we get to talk about today. Um, so obviously agriculture is a, a huge part of our community, of our area, of Kestrel country. So, yeah, hope you all enjoy a little bit of time, um, our discussion about all things ag with Ed Driscoll. So, Ed Driscoll. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So, I just thought it, uh, we're supposed to talk about agriculture today. That's, that's what you do. Yeah. And, um, but give us a little bit of background. So you're you're local from the area. Did you grow up here in, in Moscow? I did, born and raised. Um, my parents moved here, I don't know, 30 years ago. No, longer than that, more like 45 years ago. And um, born and raised, went to Moscow High School, graduated from high school, and um, went to college at U of I, played a year of baseball up at Spokane Falls Community College, and okay. I just wanted to get married to my wife and came down to Idaho, got a degree in agriculture, plant science, and took a job at WSU um, doing potato research. Nice. Got a master's while I was there and realized research is very important, but it wasn't for me long term. And uh, took a job with Syngenta as a sales rep and worked for them for almost eight years. And then now with Alba for seven years and just would love the area. Our family's here, my wife's family. Uh, she was born and raised here as well. So we just, we just love it to Palouse. Yeah. What got you into agriculture? So did, like, was your, are you a family background in agriculture? No, none. Um, my dad sold cars and then worked at the prison down in Orfino and my mom, okay. uh, taught at LCSC. Um, uh, so when I met my wife, we were both in driver's ed at 15 years old and, um, uh, she had a birthday party at her house. I think it was her 15th birthday. And there's a bunch of guys there, um, uh, Logos guys. And so farmer, local farmer called up knowing that there was a birthday party and said, Hey, I need some guys to come out and pick some rocks out of, really? out of the little field. Um, so, you know, my dad taught me to work and I liked money. And so I went out and picked rocks, uh, you know, the next Saturday and that just progressed. I just really enjoyed it. And I worked on the farm from when I was 15, his farm, he had about a 3000 acre dry land farm, North wow. of Moscow. And I worked on that farm all through high school and in college, you know, until I took a job at WSU. And that's what just piqued my interest in ag. And, you know, to get into ag, unless you marry into ag or you were born into a family farm, it's just hard to get into it, especially scale up and into actually farming into actually farming. Cause I I loved what I, you know, day to day, I just loved all aspects of it. So what were they, were they mostly, you said lentil field, they mostly doing lentils. Wheat kind of rotation. Wheat, barley, pulse crops were the were the standard rotations. You know, they had some canola in there from time to time, but mostly their rotation was wheat, barley, and, and lentils. Okay. Yeah. And that's pretty much what we have around here, yep. right? Yeah. Those are our staple crops. Okay. So was potato research, that was just an opportunity because of what you're doing at school? Or because, I mean, you're either Eastern Washington or Southern Idaho for potatoes, right? Yeah, that's correct. So 
there's a research firm that WSU has out in Othello, just outside of Othello. So we spent a lot of days and a, and a few nights out there doing potato research. But the home office was was in Pullman there on campus. Okay. Yeah. So then from there to Syngenta, um, what? So what are, what are you doing for Syngenta or for Alba now? Like so, what, when you said sales, what kind of stuff are you selling? Who's your customer? Yeah, you bet. So Syngenta started a, a wheat breeding program called AgriPro uh, many years ago. And in 2000, they started in the Pacific Northwest. And it takes, you know, seven to 10 years to get germplasm established and a variety launched. So 2007 is when they had their first variety into the marketplace. Uh, they had a couple breeders out here, a breeder and some technicians to get the program going. And so they needed a sales guy to sell wheat varieties. So it's selling seed seed to seed companies. Yes. And what's the advantage of, so what, like what, how does a, somebody like Syngenta, you've got AgriPro, um, is it higher yields? Is that kind of when they come out with a new wheat seed? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of factors, Mike, as far as what makes good genetics, but it's yield ultimately is probably king, um, but also standability. So here we get a lot of moisture right where we live here. And so if you can have really high yielding crops, but they can get taller and lodge. So stiff straw strength, disease resistance is another big one. So when we have a cool, wet spring, like we did two years ago, where we had generational yields, record yields, we can also get a lot of disease with that moisture. So building in genetic resistance. And then there's also insect resistance. So, um, you know, all those factors go in. And then maturity, you have varieties that mature earlier or later. So... There's a lot of factors that go in, and at the time, there's um, three major private entities breeding, but then you have the universities breeding as well. So there's quite a bit of competition in the Northwest for, for genetics. So when you say the universities breeding, are they then selling wheat, like seed as well? Yeah, they are, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they use um, Washington State Crop Improvement to raise their seed and sell the seed. Um, we contract through seed companies mostly, and they use farmers generally a lot in the basin just because of the higher yield potential. Um, but yeah, they, they compete as well with the private companies. Okay. So then do you have to have specific varieties, um, for specific regions then? Cause you mentioned like for us here, we've got specific issues to the Palouse. Yeah, that's right. So you'll have like a, a particular brand that is going to sell really well or do really well here versus in the basin or California or whatever. Oh, absolutely. So maturity is big when you start thinking about where varieties are grown and just, so for every 10 miles you go West, we lose about an inch of rainfall. So Hmm. we're 21 inches right here in Moscow around there every, every 10 miles. So when you get out to Connell, those guys are about 10 or nine or 10 inches of annual rainfall. So Hmm. you generally have varieties um, if, if you have a later maturing variety and it gets hot early, it's going to really affect the yield of that, of that, uh, of that variety. And then also you want a taller plant generally in drier conditions, um, because it, it'll just ultimately yield better. So yeah. And, and disease resistance highway too, it gets a lot more snow. So they have to have genetic snow mold resistance bred into those varieties or they just won't make it through the winter. Hmm. So there's. It's funny, in the early 2000s, a lot of these seed companies were selling five or six varieties. And now most of the seed companies in the area are selling 25 to 30 varieties. There's really? just that much germplasm. And a lot of that's driven by grower demand, right? And um, blend in two different varieties because they may have one might have a couple traits that are good and another variety might have a couple. And then it spreads out their risk as well. So, hmm. so what's, um, is it all wheat? Is that? All what you do? That's what I did at Syngenta okay. uh, was all wheat. And as you know, Syngenta is a large agriculture chemical company as well. So Yeah, they're one of those sometimes bad names. Yeah, right? exactly. Like- they can be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so in 2011, they kind of just changed their strategy. And, and um, I won't get into if it was good or bad, but they had sales guys go across different disciplines. So I went from just selling genetics, um, primarily cereals genetics, to selling seed treatment chemicals as well. Um, That was okay for me. In fact, it was fun to have another portfolio to sell, but you lose focus when you have more portfolio with crops and then also chemicals. That's a lot, right? Especially when we have big geographies. So uh, So that's like seed treatment. When you say seed treatment, 
their coating seed before it goes in the ground kind of thing. That's correct. Chemical. So they treat the seed again with fungicides and insecticides, biologicals, um, to protect that seed, to get out of the ground. Um, okay. On, and that's on all crops. That's just not cereals. That's on all crops. They do that on everything. Yeah, pretty much, okay. especially in the Northwest, high value, good yields. Uh, most all crops in the Northwest um, get a seed treatment. And when you get into the Midwest, um, Colorado or Kansas, some in Montana, you'll have you'll have growers that will plant seed that's not treated. But here in the Northwest, most all of our seeds are treated. So hmm. I was doing that at Syngenta. We had some really good people from Syngenta leave. Um, and do other things. And, and a guy that I worked with at Syngenta, I never worked for, um, started to work, started a seed treatment division at Alba. And that's who I currently work for. He hired about five of us across the U S and, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Cool. It's a good gig. So where's Alba out of? Alba is out of, uh, Ankeny, Iowa, which is just North of Des Moines, about a half an hour. Um, was a corn farmer in Iowa and started up a post patent, chemical company and uh it's it's evolved uh over the years it's so do years. they do seed and genetics too they do not they do so not just seed treatment seed treatment chemicals crop protection chemicals yeah okay yeah interesting yeah so it's a pretty big shift then for you from from focusing not, on yeah. genetics and yeah yeah interesting so they're going back to genetics real quick you hear Again, I, I was joking somewhat about the scary, scary name of Syngenta. You know, it's like Monsanto, and you hear all these names, and people are worked up about it. Um, what's the deal with GMO? Is that something that is an issue in the you know here with wheat in the Northwest? Is that even a thing? Um, so yeah, it's a thing. Interestingly enough, you'll see packaging on flour or. Um, seeds that, you know, people will grind their own flour that says non-GMO. There's actually no GMO wheat commercially anywhere in the world just because uh, um, the world as a whole hasn't accepted GMO in, in wheat yet. Hmm. Uh, will that day come? I don't know. I so would, they brand it that way, but anybody could put that on their absolutely, flour because there's no, it's be, not a thing. Because it's a thing to consumers, right? There's a lot of consumers that are just anti-GMO, right or wrong. Um, Which what's so, I mean, for somebody who's completely ignorant of it, what's the difference? So you're talking about creating varieties. You're just talking about breeding certain varieties. That has nothing to do with genetically modified no. anything. You just take so completely different. Two parents, um, breeding those parents together and coming up with, with, uh, a new variety basically. Yeah. And then okay. you have to purify it. That's why it takes so long. Uh, generally it's seven to 10 years Oh wow! and there's things that can speed that up a little bit, but you know, you make an initial cross, um, and it, you just have to purify it basically, and then ultimately test it year over year. So that's why it takes quite a while. I, it's funny. I have, you know, when I was at Syngenta and even at Alba, you sit next to people on the airplane and, and GMO is often a bad word. And, and I think the first trait is BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis was the first GMO trait and it was for an insect in corn. And so you think about it, I mean, there, there, are, there, there can be some bad things, but there's more good in my opinion with GMO. But so you breed a trait into corn that gives it resistance to this bug. Well, that cuts your pesticide or insecticide use down significantly. Mm. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah. You know, the other one I use is, is a lot of the cotton that we use is genetically modified. So people are often anti GMO, but they're wearing cotton t-shirts that, so, I mean, it's just, there can be some bad things as well, but I, it's education more than anything is important. Yeah. So now Alba, mm -hmm. uh, Alba, 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 yeah, everybody Alba. says it differently. Yeah. <laughs> So where, did, where did the name Alba come from? You say Dennis Alba. It's actually a person. There you go. Yeah. And he's still around? He, yeah, still he's there. great. And he's, That's awesome. you know, American born. Um, it's an American company. He's the first time I went to the head office there in Ankeny. I had a non-compete with Syngenta because I went from selling seed treatment to selling seed treatment for this company. And, and I, honored it. I honored it. Syngenta was very good to me. And so I took some customers down there to Ankeny. Um, Dennis has a very extensive uh, car collection, and he has his own golf course. So it's kind of fun to go down there as well and, and have a little fun when you go down there. But we had a meeting, and I presented on some research, and I had some coworkers on there that talked seed treatments and things like that. But uh, 
Dennis was there, and he was wearing a, a three-button white polo shirt and jean shorts, sweeping the back deck. You know, hmm. he's he's wow. very very successful. He's got a huge company, um, over five countries. I mean, he's just but he's very very genuine, and he cares about people, and he cares about customers. And you know, as a sales guy working for him, it's that's that's the kind of guy you want to work for. That's awesome. Yeah. So do you work? Is it mostly right around here? Or are you working? I cover my Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and part of Montana. So it sounds like a big geography. One of the reasons or factors when I left Syngenta was four kids, as you know. Um, and I was getting up to about 100 nights. I had California as well. 100 nights is just too much. It was trying to raise a family. And, and uh, so I'm about half that travel, a little bit less geography. And uh, it's great. Nice. But I do spend a lot of time Monday... I drove down to Pocatello, nine hour drive for an hour meeting. We had a guy, yeah. a couple guys fly out from the Dakotas, had an hour meeting and came back because I had to be in Tico to present at a meeting. So, um, you know, we get after it a little bit, miles and pickups and airplanes, yeah. but that's fun. So is it, are you mostly, is it all dry land stuff that you're doing now with them or all kinds of stuff? No. So we supply seed treatment for all crops, basically. Um, core crops would be corn, soybeans, cereals. Uh, pulses, uh, legumes, pulses cotton, are pulses, dry are. beans, lentils, correct. That kind of thing. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so like South Idaho and then you got irrigated and dry land markets. So in all that geography, I mean, you have pretty much cradle right. to grave from, uh, from a cropping standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. But around here, every it's all dry land. So what pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, as you, the as, when you get out into the Columbia Basin, most all that's irrigated. But yeah, around, right here yeah, and around the, the Palouse, Palouse. Is, is dry land. Yep. What makes this area unique? I mean, talking locally now. Um, so the Palouse, we've got these rolling hills. They're kind of hard to farm from a, you know, geog from a terrain standpoint, right? Yeah. Um, but we have, you said 21 inches of moisture a year. Yeah, 21 is, to 24. Is that a lot? Is that, I mean, in terms of, um, yeah, what, like what makes the Palouse really great for? Well, a couple things, especially from a cereal standpoint, um, wheat is a cool season crop and we have really rich soils. Um, and the moisture that we get the 21 inches. So there's other parts of the country that get that much moisture, but we get it at the perfect time. Okay. So as you know, we get most of our, we get, Good snow cover, so that protects the crops, the winter wheat crops. Um, and then in the springtime, we generally get good moisture through May, not last year, but yeah. most years we get that 21 inches. We get a lot of that, about half or two thirds of that from you know January to end of May, which is when that wheat crop needs it the most. Well, most crops need it the most, and and that's that plus the soil. Soils that we have um, are probably the two biggest factors why this is such a high producing cereals region. Okay. And then it gets really hot and dry. Mm -hmm. And that's important too, right? That's so important that everything... too for harvest. Yeah. So we raise a lot of chickpeas out here as well. And the only reason we can do that is because they, you know, they come to maturity end of August, depending on where you're at, but mostly September. And as you know, I mean, our August and September's are very dry, generally speaking. So yeah. that allows us to get those crops in. And then, you know, the cereals crops starts um, July to end of September, even into early October, just depending on what, where we're at in the, in the PNW. But, and is that partly because of you got, you've got your winter wheat, so they plant that in the fall, uh -huh. and then that sits all winter. And does it come up under the snow? No. So it just sits under the snow yep. until... It starts. Yeah. Once it gets cold and the soils get cold enough, that the wheat will go dormant and then the snow will protect it. So where we run into problems, so the wheat can actually die, it can either desiccate or it can die just from cold temperatures. So snow cover is good, um, but it has to get pretty cold. So the And the advantage there then is it's already in the ground once things start to warm up and get better before you could actually get on it because yeah. you know, it's muddy or whatever to yeah. plant. Okay. Yeah, and winter wheat yields... I don't want to say a percentage because it just depends on a lot of factors, but it yields more than spring wheat. But from okay. a maturity standpoint, they come right very similarly. Oh, really? Winter wheat versus spring wheat. Yeah. So they're they're ready about the same time. About the same time. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And then um, what – so crop rotation, a lot of times you hear that. Um, 
guys around here, are they going wheat to pulses? Is there a reason for that rotation? I mean, what, what does that look like? Most of most, most growers in this geography right around the Moscow Pullman area um, are on a three year rotation. So they go cereals, pulse cereals, you know, and then when I say cereals, they'll go wheat, barley, and then into a pulse crop or canola. Canola is a big one. And a lot of that's dictated by price. Um, Canola is high priced right now. Inputs are really high right now. So canola will be up and also uh, pulses will probably be up. Um, The factors that drive that, the reason in our three year rotation is, is primarily disease. So if you plant wheat on wheat on wheat on wheat, um, you, you're you're just making problems for wheat diseases primarily. Okay. And so when you grow other crops, you break up that cycle. And the other thing that's good is, like pulse crops, they give like peas will give you nitrogen, extra nitrogen in the soil um, for the wheat crop following it. So there's there's another factor there why guys rotate. Okay. Is barley fairly big? I mean, I feel like I he- you hear wheat all the time in the news or whatever and. But you don't hear that much about barley. They grow a lot of barley here. We don't grow near the barley that like South Idaho. South Idaho grows a lot of barley, and actually, there's been a big shift. So we used to raise a fair amount of feed barley, so barley that was raised for consumption by us or or animals. But we're seeing more and more. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Brood barley. Um, oh yeah. What do they call that? I'm, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank. But barley they use for brewing. Um, yeah, I'll think of it in about a minute or two. <laughs> uh, but we're raising a lot more of that, and there's actually some food barley um, that that's being raised too. But there's just it seems like there's less barley now, and a lot, again, a lot of that's dictated it's by price. Price, yeah. okay, yeah, and that's that's just a global, complicated thing, right? Yeah. It depends on what they're growing in Europe and everywhere else, and what the demand is like. Mm-hmm. What are prices like now? So what was last year, obviously we had, at least in this area, a lot of drought. Yep. Um, what is What are prices doing? Prices are really good. And, and you're right. A lot of that's driven by the world supply market. So stocks are lower. Prices is high. I think yesterday it was 850-ish a bushel, which is pretty good. Um, it's really okay. good. Um, I said generational drought last year. Uh, you know, we talk about 50-year drought when we had this level of lack of rainfall or or yields was i think it was 1977 okay is when we saw this level of drought um so knock on wood we don't get two in a row um but again two years ago 2021 excuse me 2020 we had extremely good moisture cooler temps all through spring and early summer and you the same guys that got hurt bad from from the drought last year cut record yields the year before that yeah so that's ideal. That's what you want. That's cool, you want. a lot of moisture. Yep. Early on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. When the wheat flowers, and it, it just depends on when they when they plant, when the wheat flowers and pollinates and you start setting that seed, that's when it's most vulnerable to high temperatures. And so having rain and cooler temps during that seed fill is 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 key. So last year that had to have been a one two punch because oh, we bad. had what it was June and it was super hot yeah. last year. Remember we had a, a week of a hundred degrees and yeah. that's really bad right at the beginning of June from okay. from a from a production standpoint. What um, so uh, inflation we hear about that all the time. Groceries going up, all that kind of stuff. I imagine that's going to be across the board from chemicals to obviously oils going up now. So that's got to be a fairly big input for farmers. Um, are all those inputs just going up with everything else? Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm not in the fertilizer world, but you talk about oil prices being pushing on $100 a barrel. That, that affects fertilizer price big time. And the other big one is is we just we get a lot from foreign markets in the ag industry. And we also ship a lot um, from the U.S. to other markets. Well, I mean, you've seen in the news where the first of the year or December, there was a hundred ships sitting in Long Beach trying yep. to get in. They can't get unloaded. Well, that's, that's bringing stuff into us in the ag industry, but it's also shipping product out to other countries and the cost of containers is four or five X what it used to be. So yeah, I'm out, Kelly, just my wife went to the store the other day and paid five bucks for cream cheese. And usually that's, that's two bucks. And it's just, you know, we're increasing cost on our end from a supplier standpoint to the seed companies. And that just trickles down all the way to, to you and I at the grocery store. Yeah. 
Well, last, uh, kind of last question. What, um, have you seen, so you've been doing this for about 15 years yeah. in the sales side. Yeah. Have you seen any trends, um, as far as things changing in the industry overall? Do you have fewer customers now? Cause there's consolidation. I mean, what, what do you see happening? Maybe if you can speak specifically to the Palouse, like around here with farms, with farming, um, what's that looking like? What do you see as the future around here? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of consolidation, not just from a company standpoint, but also from a farming standpoint. So farms are getting bigger. I mean, it, when I was working on that farm that I did, how long ago was that? 25 years ago, a 3000 acre farm. And there was a lot of guys that farmed 1500 acres. And now the, there's very, very few farms that are under 3000 acres. That would be a mm -hmm. very small farm now. So there's a lot of consolidation with farms. Um, guys are getting bigger, but you think about uh, seed companies. So there was a lot of co-ops. You had Genesee Union, um, you had Whitman County, you had all these co-ops in these smaller towns, and a lot of these co-ops have been merging. And um, it's interesting. Back when I was at Syngenta, we used to have discussions on what's what's the next ten years look like, and we we called them mega co-ops. And that's what's happened is there's mm. just a lot of co-op mergers. Private seed companies are becoming less and less. There's a few of them out there, uh, and they're strong, um, but that there, there's a lot of consolidation there too. And these so co-ops, um, what does that mean? Is this individual farmers are all buy-in membership in order to sell their product mostly? Is that what they're doing? Correct. Yeah. So they okay. they 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 buy into the co-op, uh, and then they get discounts and and better pricing structures and a place to haul and store their grain. Uh, and there's a fee for that, right? But then they get crop up, crop updates. And one of the things these co-ops has evolved to, which is great for the industry, is um, they're doing a lot of their own research. So hmm. variety research, um, seed treatment research, crop protection research, um, and supplying that information to their growers. And that's you know that's how they compete against other co-ops. The other thing I'll say that's big in the industry, and you know my daughter works for you. Um, I would encourage her. You know, there's a lot more women in agriculture, and I think there needs to be more too. We've seen a lot more of that, and um, agriculture is getting bigger and faster. There's a lot of consolidation. We've the company that I work for, Alba. We've had two acquisitions over the last 18 months, and it's mm. it's exciting for us to just grow naturally by uh, through acquisition. And I, we're going to continue to see that. Yeah, so I think it's something that isn't often on radar for somebody who's maybe you know, high school, looking to go into college, um, thinking about their career options, right? Everybody's talking about computer science or whatever. Yeah. What would you, what would you say to somebody who's either not considering agriculture, why they should, or if somebody is what they should maybe do to try to get into that? Like you said, if you're not a generational farmer, how do you, how do you get into ag or why would you get into ag? Well, agriculture is just like big tech companies in the sense that there's there's a lot of different jobs you can do. You don't have to be a sales guy with product knowledge, right? So when I say I've encouraged my daughter to get into agriculture, she does marketing and promotion for you guys, digital media. Well, all these big companies are doing that, right? And they need people that are trained that know how to do digital market, uh, digital marketing. They don't need to know a lot about the portfolios. I mean, the more they know, the better. Obviously, same with when they're when they're they're helping you all. But I mean, you you really can be pretty broad in an ag degree and, and, and find a spot in agriculture. I mean, I, my, myself personally, I said R and D is very important, but, um, you know, it's, it takes a different mindset and I'm a, I'm a people person. I like to talk and I like to interact and I like to travel. I, I'm just wired as a sales guy, I think. So, uh, I, I had no intention of being a sales guy when I went to college. I just knew I liked agriculture and, you know, we're going through those discussions with Jack. He's, pretty interested in agriculture, but he also is, well, I want to be a sales guy. So he's not sure yet, but yeah. So there's a lot of different things you could do. Oh, absolutely. Just find somebody who's in the industry and look for a way to see how you can help and get yep. involved. And, um, obviously our universities here are pretty heavily into ag. So there's, awesome. I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities yeah. there. Too. There are. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, thanks Ed. Yeah. Terrific. I appreciate the time. Yeah. yeah it was fun. really interesting. And yeah, good luck with this uh, spring season coming up. All right, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next week.